Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be here this evening. We're grateful for um, the many, many blessings in our lives and for the opportunity that we have to come and uh, partake of the spirit that's here and listen to Brother Moyle and um, his story. We're thankful for his time and effort and we ask thee to bless him that his tongue won't be loosed and he'll be able to share the thoughts and feelings and um, desires of his heart. We are grateful for um, this gospel, for the opportunity that we have to learn and grow together. And um, we pray for thy spirit to be with us and ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Grateful to be here tonight. Welcome to everybody. We're the Charettes. We're excited to um, share for just a minute today a song that's called He Is My All. It's talking about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And um, I try not to talk before we sing because then I cry. So anyway, um, when I was thinking about the words of this song, it talks about our Savior being our all. And I thought, but I have so much so much in my life, so many great things. I have a wonderful husband, I have family, I have lots of things. He's my all, he's my all. And I thought, huh, you know what it talks about to me, it speaks to me about, is that um, when I am un like unable to be comforted by anything in this world, when um, even my marriage, my kids, my grandkids even, um, can't comfort me because of whatever I'm feeling. Um, yeah, fi almost five years ago now, uh, we lost our oldest son. I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be able to sing. Um, and there was a time at that time where I was really unable to be comforted by anything in this world, yeah, truly anything in this world. Um, and my savior was there for me at that time. And this song, that's what it's talking about when it says is he's my all to me. Um, Anyway, I think that's it. Should we? Okay. Do you want to sing it again? my 
Thank you, Dave and Carolyn. Appreciate that. Wonderful. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Elder Dixon. I am a grateful, recovering codependent and happy to be here with all of you. Excited about this wonderful fireside, um, a fireside of miracles tonight. Before I introduce James, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is... Um, uh, just welcome all those also that are live streaming with us and remind all of us that right after the um, uh, James is done speaking, we'll have a prayer, but then we'll have question and answers. And so as, as James talking and you, th and you think, oh, I, I would love to ask him this question. Think about that because you'll have that opportunity. Those of you who are live streaming with us, uh, send it through the chat. Dave will send it up to me on my phone, on text, and we'll be able to answer questions that way as well. So those of you who are live stream, please um, participate with questions as well. <clears throat> now, James Moyle has got an incredible story. Um, his first addiction was to adrenaline, believe it or not. Um, he was constantly getting chased by the police in motorcycles, in cars. Um, we might see a video on that as well. He was fortunate to have his bi a great bishop, Bishop Meech, right? And uh, that's what he was called. And uh, helped him get on a mission. S served an honorable, a very successful mission. But got into adrenaline sports after his mission. Shortly after there, drugs and alcohol followed. James went through treatment after going to jail twice for fighting and uh, resisting arrest. He then, he, he stayed straight, graduated from the University of Utah, went to MBA school at BYU, married well, had wonderful kids, four, right? Four wonderful kids, had a great career then, Helicopter skiing led to a knee in injury, and James got into a horrible uh, addiction with high doses of prescription drugs. After a lot of unsuccessful treatment, he was asked to leave his family, his wife, and his kids. James fell in, uh, onto the streets and had a needle in his arms for five years. He was in and out of jail 13, 13 more times. Permanently kicked out of the homeless shelter. Then he died and was revived several times. On the streets as a full-time addict for five years. Really, really, he was a dead man walking. Afraid of permanent spiritual death. James finally begged his Heavenly Father to save him. And then a series of miracles happened. The redeeming power of Jesus Christ woke up James. There was a spiritual awakening. The miracle that followed in his recovery, amazing. Um, Please have a prayer in your heart as James shares. He's going to share some very personal, embarrassing, vulnerable things. Please have a prayer in your heart for him and for you 
what can you learn? What is there in his message that can give you hope and healing? With that, let's turn the time over to James. I, want, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I have family and friends in here, and uh, I see the Nielsen's, Chris, and Heidi over there that represent a family that's <coughs> played a big part in my recovery. Um, <clears throat> my daughter Mary is here with her scruffy looking boyfriend. He, always, he plays football for the youth, so he always looks like he just took a helmet off. No, he's a handsome kid. Um, I'm grateful for, uh, for friends that have reached out from out of state that are on Zoom that I haven't seen some of them in 30 years, but I, I love you too. My remarks today focus on how the redeeming power of Jesus Christ saved and then changed my life. In my case, the master shepherd literally left the 99 to save the one, which was me. It's an honor to be asked by Elder Rick Dixon to participate and share with you one of the key steps that finally helped save my life. Step four, doing a fearless moral inventory. Rick, I haven't known you for long, but I'm very impressed by you and your organization and, and, and for the work that you personally do as a service missionary. I appreciate how you run this area. Other areas should take note of how you're running yours as evidenced by how others respond to what you are doing. I have folks even from out of state that have told me that they follow their speaker series on Zoom. They not only watch on Zoom in their recovery groups, but they are bringing their own family members in that are non-addicts that desperately want to learn how to help their loved ones. The Q&A you produce after for folks that want to call in is something powerful that they particularly enjoy because you draw them together and promote on-spot healing. You're non-judgmental, hence very Christ-like, and I really appreciate that quality about you, Rick. My hope is that leaders from other areas in the greater recovery community of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will take note of what you're doing here. Now, who'd have thought that sitting in jail five years ago for the 15th time as a chronic addict, having died several times and having luckily been brought back each time, that I would be so fortunate to be here with you today, and even alive. I'm grateful for the opportunity to express my gratitude for the rescuing and redeeming power of Jesus Christ. His power is manifest in who he sent to save me, which includes my father and ancestors, who I know were fighting for me from the other side of the veil. I have family here today in this room from both sides of the from both sides of the veil. Everyone from heaven above to people sitting here made a joint effort to save me from the gates of Hades and help me reclaim my soul. And I'm grateful to you. I was born into an incredible family. Books were written and movies were made about our ancestors. My great uncle Henry D. Moyle was an apostle and served as first counselor to President David O. McKay. President Gordon B. Hinckley wrote a book about my great grandfather entitled James Henry Moyle, Distinguished American Churchman. James eventually served in President Franklin D. Roosevelt's cabinet as the acting secretary of the treasury. James helped figure out a way to help pay for the enormous expense of World War II, which helped guarantee the freedoms that we enjoy today. But let me talk about a particular ancestor that I think of and feel daily. His name is John Romoyle, and he is my great, great, great grandfather. John and his son James who inspired a direct line of James is all the way to my son James, were converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ in England. They were master stonemasons and worked the rest of their lives on the, on the Salt Lake Temple and other local structures. I draw strength from John's experience, especially because of the daily pain I know he endured for decades in service to his Heavenly Father. Brigham Young asked John to settle Alpine, which is 22 miles directly south of the Salt Lake Temple, and the direct route was up and over the point of the mountain. 
They couldn't afford a horse. They could barely afford a cow. So John would get up at 2 a.m. on Monday mornings and bolt on foot the 22 miles to the Salt Lake Temple so he could be to his post on time. Then on Friday after work, he'd walk back, getting home by midnight. He used every Saturday to catch up on the farm and give his dear wife a break from daily chores. He was impatient one Saturday morning, milking old Bessie, a wild cow that had been captured on Antelope Island and only semi-tame. That fateful morning, the course of John's life would change forever. Old Bessie kicked John in the leg, causing a horrible compound fracture. In the 1800s, the only course of action for such a catastrophe was to amputate. They took a door off its, hit, off its hinges, strapped John to the door, and cut his leg off with a buck saw. The worst fear back then was, of course, infection, which many died from in that day. John survived. The next spring, John fashioned himself a prosthetic leg. It was crude and extremely painful, but eventually, John was able to walk around the house. Pretty soon, he could walk around the yard. And after a little while, he was walking around his farm. One Monday morning at 2 a.m., John woke up, packed his bag for the week, kissed his wife. And on that crude prosthetic leg, walked the 22 miles. Because he'd never been released from his calling as a stonemason on the temple. He walked on that stump leg week after week, the 44-mile round trip, year after year, until his death. The last thing John did was carve the gold plaque high on the East Temple wall that says, Holiness to the Lord. This is the house of the Lord as an enzyme to all those that would come to the Salt Lake Temple. You can see why I think and am inspired by him often. I bear testimony to you that I know he is nearby, if not in this room right now. I also bear testimony to you that you too have ancestors that help you and your family, especially when times are tough. We have a loving Heavenly Father and Savior Jesus Christ that watch out for us, know who we are, and care about each one of us deeply. They send angelic help. Now comes the hard part for me to spit out. <clears throat> Please know that I don't say any of this with braggadocio. It is what it is, and it is imperative that I just own the truth every time. The fourth step of the addiction recovery program of the Church of Jesus Christ, like I said, is to consistently work and rework, making a fearless moral inventory. Every time I'm asked to speak, I get to own the truth in a way that helps me and hopefully helps some of you too. Please allow me to get this out right now. I became a lying, cheating, thieving, duplicitous hypocrite in my addiction. I fell off the wagon after my mission and that's when that pattern started. I became the type of person that gave the church a bad name and that was not okay. Now is the time to also tell you as I touched on before that I know without a doubt that there's an incredible dynamic in this room today because I know that there are certain special people nearby that give me strength that are on the other side of the veil, namely my father, my grandparents, and my great-grandparents, among other special people to my family. I thank them and speak to them as much as I speak to you tonight. I know that you too have angelic help nearby. Please allow me to start at the beginning as a youth I was a wild child. My first addiction was adrenaline. My parents lost track of how many times I was taken to the ER because of the death-defying stunts I was always involved in. I won't get into them, they're, all, they're nutty. We used to keep a running count of how many stitches I had received, but eventually my family and the hospitals lost track because the number became too large to negotiate. At 15, I went skydiving for the first time, instantly addicted. By then, I was already doing crazy stunts on skis off the rocks and cliffs at the local ski resorts. I loved cliff diving, especially off the cliffs at Lake Powell. I was constantly getting chased by the police and the sheriff's department in whatever car and whatever, or on whatever motorcycle I had. 
I learned that if I mixed drugs, alcohol, and adrenaline together, that this was the ultimate cocktail. At East High, I got good grades simply to keep my wonderful parents off my back. I was a bad example. Especially to my little brothers. A police officer tackled one of my brothers on our front lawn once, thinking he was tackling me. My father threw the officer off our property. <clears throat> and, <laughs> and dad didn't have a violent bone in his body. He was just being a dad. I'm sorry for that. So many other things, dad. At the University of Utah, I joined the Sigma Chi fraternity as my father and grandfather had. President Russell and Nelson was a Sigma Chi at the U. What an elite group of men. Then there was me. I was out of control and thought the rules did not apply to me. I had an incredible bishop. His name was Craig Meacham. Like Hilder Dixon said, we all called him Meach. Bishop Meacham worked with me weekly, and eventually I received a mission called to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I served honorably and successfully. But when I returned from my mission, I re-engaged in adrenaline activities and drugs and alcohol followed. Fighting and resisting arrest landed me in jail twice, and I went to rehabs to avoid felony convictions. I went to rehabs for the wrong reasons. I got into big wall rock climbing and high altitude mountaineering. While climbing Mount McKinley, also known as Denali, 11 people died in the month that I was there in June of 1992. I was able to rescue a man, a story I'll share another day. It isn't ironic that I had to have 150 felons later on in my life rescue me. I was able to summit and ski off the mountain, but death was all around me, and it scared me. And because of my sport, I cleaned up my life, not wanting to die in sin. I went to MBA school at BYU and met, met and married a wonderful woman. I had success in sobriety, built a beautiful new home, and started a family. We had an opportunity to go to Harvard where I relapsed for the first time in years. This happened in large part because when I went through treatment, I was never fully engaged in doing a, a fearless moral inventory. Back home, I found success as a real estate developer. We had four incredible children. After a surgery, I discovered that opiate painkillers had gotten much stronger. I lied to myself that the doctors gave me the drugs, so that was okay. Biggest lie ever. I would have periods of clean time, then I would relapse. Like I said, I became a dishonest, lying, manipulating, hypocritical thief in my addiction, and my family did not have that coming. Like I also said, I became the kind of fool that gave the church a bad name, and I became the opposite of everything that my family stood for. My wife eventually had to invite me to leave. It was the right thing for her to do. I fell onto the streets. I was a coward. And that's not the way I was raised. I quickly went to the needle with methamphetamine and heroin, the strongest combination I could find to numb that shame. I fought to keep that needle full. I was permanently kicked out of the road home, Salt Lake's drug and crime infested homeless shelter. It was pretty hard to get permanently kicked out of the road home. I've torn it down now, it was such a horrible place. I was in and out of jail 13 more times. I died on several occasions, in the back of an ambulance, in a hotel room, and on the streets. I was a dead man walking. I would climb up the outside of buildings to balconies and throw expensive bikes down into bushes and trade them for meth. I stole a gun from a policeman and traded it for heroin. The last of the light that was once inside of me was almost gone. Occasionally, I felt my father angelically at my side and I bear testimony to you that I know that that is true. I was leaning against a convenience store in Sugar House. I had a moment of clarity and begged Heavenly Father for the, for the first time in years. It was the first time I prayed in probably five years. I begged him to save me, and I begged him for the right to be with my children again. Miracles began. I couldn't believe what happened next. I hadn't seen him in 35 years. But my former bishop, Craig Meacham, came walking up. I knew that it was a direct answer to prayer. I jumped up and said, Meach. He looked at me and said, who are you? I had lost 100 pounds. It was probably bloody. I was an animal. 
I said, it's James Moyle, and the look on his face, I didn't feel shame because in that instant, I knew that he loved me and cared about me. He went home and told his wife, Marianne, who said, let's go back and get him. They put me up in a hotel and tried to give me work. The hotel kicked me out because I was an animal and couldn't flip the switch that quickly. Meets consulted with Joseph Granny, who had founded the Other Side Academy, also known as Tosa. Joseph was in Meech's ward in that neighborhood that I grew up in. Tosa is a minimum two and a half year long life skills therapeutic community for the chronically homeless, incarcerated, and addicted, of which I became all three. Tosa is not a rehab. I needed a lot more help than a traditional rehab could offer. Tosa is a nonprofit that takes no government funding or insurance subsidies and is free to anyone that is truly ready to change his, his or her life. Tosa is uniquely self-reliant and runs social enterprises to fund its growth. This is why politicians love the Other Side Academy. Tosa won the Ernst & Young Award for the best business for the Other Side Movers. I tease the movers because I, I say, now you get to go in people's homes and move their most precious belongings. And you, know, you used to do that without their permission. The average number of jail and prison stays for students at the Other Side Academy is 25 times. I was on the low end 15 times. Meech took me to sit on the bench at Tosa, which is a portal to a new life. I read the 12 beliefs on the wall, which were the gospel of Jesus Christ put simply. Shame hit, and I left and got high. I was hit by a car. I don't even remember it. I woke up broken in the ICU. My mouth was wired shut for four months, and I had braces on both legs for almost a year. I was in that clinic where I finally learned how to walk again. Meech and Marianne visited me often. Meech led the charge with my children to get me back to the Other Side Academy. Meech took me to our old ward up in Federal Heights to meet Joseph Grenny. The whole ward was wrapping Christmas presents for the students of the Other Side Academy. Memories of my upbringing, upbringing flooded my mind and heart. I was truly conflicted because I didn't have the confidence to ever think that I could succeed. I had lost my fearlessness. I heard stories of chronic addicts that had succeeded and become staff members at the Other Side Academy. One story affected me deeply. Her name was Tiffany. <laughs> Tiffany grew up under a viaduct in Salt Lake. <clears throat> Her mother was a prostitute and horrible things happened. Tiffany fought tooth and nail to defend herself, her mother, and her younger siblings from the ravages of the street. Because of her environment, Tiffany had to become a street warrior. I was in tears hearing the story. I hadn't felt emotion in years. Tiffany got the opportunity to go to the other side of the academy, and then she became a true warrior for good. Tiffany then became a staff member at Tosa and helped in saving my life. As Meech drove me back to the rehabilitation facility, he was inspired to show me something that sealed the deal for me to go back to the Other Side Academy. After just having introduced me to Joseph Grinney, he decided to show me where Joseph was rebuilding his house. He drove me past the home that I grew up in. As he neared a particular property that was near and dear to my heart, because my grandparents had originally owned the property, I was thinking to myself, there's no way he's going to point at that property. And of course he did. My father had come home from his mission to that home, and he fell in love with that neighborhood and, laid, and later raised us on the same street. My grandparents had later gifted that property to President Harold B. Lee, who was president of the church at that time, because he enjoyed the serenity there. While I was on the streets, one of my hustles was to fly a sign at the Home Depot that said, I speak Spanish and can manage workers. Once I was hired and taken to work at a home in the old neighborhood I grew up in, I was embarrassed to find out that the man that hired me to work was a relative of President Harold B. Lee and took me to work at that exact same home. I thought of my grandparents, father, aunts, and uncles as I walked through that home. What are the odds? I thought of administering the sacrament as a deacon to Sister Lee, which I did in that home on several occasions. I was ashamed. 
as a real estate developer, I knew what chain of title looked like on that property. James Douglas and Louise Covey Moyle, Harold B. Lee and his family, and now Joseph and Celia Grenny, the founders of the Other Side Academy. Meech looked at me and said, James, the Lord has just parted the Red Sea for you. If you don't follow through on this, you're blind. And I agreed to go back to the Other Side Academy. And this is where the real work for me finally began. The Lord used 150 ex-cons, all with stories similar to mine, to realign my compass. There are absolutely no school professionals at the Other Side Academy. We could partially fool ourselves, our families, friends, doctors, therapists, clinicians, judges, etc. But we absolutely cannot fool each other. Leadership at the Other Side Academy is run by those that have graduated from the School of Hard Knocks. There's not one single staff member that has a degree or a professional license. They are who the Lord used to save my life by leading me to finally do a fearless moral inventory. So let me be clear, previous to that, I obviously had never been honest about who I had become. I had never done an inventory, let alone a fearless one. It took 150 felons to basically shove that down my throat until I was finally able to, to process who, who I had really become. They told me that truth and would let me off the hook for two and a half years straight. And about halfway through that process, I slowly started to buy in. The key for me was finally overcoming shame and being able to get down and pray again. That was the, that was the turning point for me. I'll give you a quick example of what this process looks like. We call them breakthrough groups. In this example, a man in our therapeutic community wrote a female a love letter. This is strictly forbidden for obvious, obvious reasons. Here is how it was brought to him so he could understand the gravity of what he'd done. Play number one. The man that brought Jeffy that bad behavior is Dave DeRocher, the executive director of the Other Side Academy. He literally spent the first half of his life helping people die. Then Dave got an opportunity to go to a therapeutic community like ours called Delancey Street, and with that experience created the Other Side Academy, and now is spending the rest of his life, the second half of his life, helping people live. <clears throat> I'm very lucky to have never been convicted of a felony, but I had several misdemeanors pending when I went back to Tosa. Toward the end of my first year back at the Other Side Academy, the judges got together and dismissed all of my cases. I felt like there was really nothing keeping me there anymore, not realizing that I still had a ton of work to do. I contemplated leaving, trying to do it on my own. Making that wrong decision would have definitely killed me. I sat down with Dave DeRocher one morning in his office and he told me to stay, be a man, and finish the commitment that I made to fully change my life and be with my children again. Dave challenged me to make a comeback and told me that I would have to fight. He said that I was in the halftime of my life and that the odds were stacked against me. He reminded me of the 2017 Super Bowl where the Patriots were down 28-3 at halftime. He, remind me, he reminded me that I had the inner strength to make that comeback happen, like the Patriots did when they came back to win from the biggest halftime deficit in Super Bowl history. Then Joseph Granny pulled me aside. He too knew that I was struggling. Joseph sat me down and told me of a youth, youth conference that he had attended. Joseph said that the speaker toward the end of his talk had someone come up to the podium, tie a string, that was on the end of a large ball of twine to the microphone and walked down off the podium, out into the audience, out the door, and out into the parking lot. Then he had somebody from the other side come and tie a ball of twine to the microphone and go out the other way, the same way. The speaker then grabbed the microphone where the two strings were attached and pointed with his left hand and said, that is our preexistent life. And he pointed the other direction and said, that's eternity. And then Joseph looked at me and said, James, the lesson is that you are right here, right now, where the strings are attached to the microphone. What you do right here, right now, 
will affect the eternal trajectory. Make the right choice now and stay where you are. Do the work. If you stay, that will positively change the outcome of eternity for you. Like I mentioned, we sit, we have this therapy session twice a week called Breakthrough Groups. And we sit in, in a room twice a week for two hours and hear about our chronic bad behaviors. Having those behaviors brought to me over and over like this, usually in a very hard in your face vernacular, I was finally able to own bad behavior after bad behavior. Wouldn't it have been more simple to simply get a sponsor and have the courage to do a fearless moral inventory so I could start the process of changing my behaviors? Everybody loves sauces, but nobody likes to see how it's made. Get with a sponsor. Start your fearless moral inventory. Don't wait until it gets so bad that you almost lose everything like I did. Tosa continues to help me make good decisions today. I'll give you an example. I went skydiving again this summer for the first time in years. Something interesting happened. Although I was completely sober, I got high as a kite off the, off the jump. And that adrenaline was in my system for a couple of hours. And it felt horrible. It didn't feel right, so I went and spoke to my peers at the other side academy and knew that that was my last time to do something like that again. Today, with years of sobriety from drugs and alcohol, I have my children back in my life. I have family and friends in my life that have embraced the gift of forgiveness, which include my former wife, Kristen, and her awesome husband, Brian. Absolute miracles. The three of us just recently sat in the celestial room and communed with each other with our daughter, Mary, who just took out her endowments. How many people can honestly say, and mean it, that they don't have a single negative thing to say about their former spouse? their former spouse's family, or their former spouse's new spouse. No one was hurt worse than my former wife and my children. Folks say they forgive but don't realize that forgiveness is an action, just like love or just like true recovery. It's not what we say but what we actually do. I'm so grateful for the family and friends that actually do. But I understand those that don't. I know that I wouldn't forgive me if the situation was reversed. I don't believe I'm capable of that kind of forgiveness. I'm just, I'm just being honest. I'm too spiritually immature. I have a long way to go still. It's become cathartic to share my fearless moral inventories with others. Most people want to stay anonymous, and I totally understand that. But for me, I had to learn to share who I had become with everyone wherever I went. What did I have to lose? All of a sudden, something incredible started to happen. Those that I really wanted to back in my life forgave me because of my fearless moral inventory and started asking me if I would share my story with others. This made me a lot stronger. As I became fearless in sharing the truth, friends and family came back into my life stronger than ever before. I was so grateful to have my health back. I was so happy to have the only things that I can take with me when I leave this life, my inner strength, light, and knowledge, and my connections with others. As I owned the inventory of my life's wrongs, everything right started to happen. And relationships with people became the biggest part of my gratitude list. I wanted a way to show everyone how grateful I was, so I made, made it formal by thanking them like this. Play number two.
OIKMI for a guy that basically had to learn how to walk again to have so many blessings that, that give me joy, especially my family and especially my children. That was a tribute to heaven and everybody that helped me along the way. And that list is continuing to grow as I speak to you right now. And I say thank you to all of you. <clears throat> now this is to you that have not done a fear fearless moral inventory. If you're not honest with yourself, only death and destruction awaits. Because it will only get worse unless you're honest with yourself. I've literally watched on several occasions people leave the other side academy to go finish 20 plus year prison sentences because that's easier than hearing the truth about themselves. It's just crazy to me. Use this divine process with the 12 steps of the addiction recovery program to save your life and learn how to become fearless in life's pursuits. Joseph Smith said, salvation Salvation cannot come to the world without the mediation of Jesus Christ. The fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of apostles and prophets concerning Jesus. Concerning Jesus Christ that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day and ascended into heaven. And all other things are only appendages that pertain to our religion to that. Let me ask you this question. Who is saved by this mediation? Well, I'll tell you one thing for sure. Everyone and anyone can benefit, especially if you put in the work and use the repentance process designed to turn weaknesses into strengths. That's Ether 1227 in action. Please do yourself a favor. Look to those in the scriptures that have overcome the Apostle Paul, Alma the Younger, the sons of Messiah, especially Ammon. Study them. Bishop Meacham is always reminding me to study these men. What guarantees success? Turning our wills and our lives over to God. That starts and is made better by continually making ourselves stronger, by refining our fearless moral inventories. Go back and keep redoing them. Any one of us can overcome any challenge through the redeeming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul testifies of it in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make way that you may be able to escape and bear it. Today I'm reaching new summits in life. I do this by remembering both past summits and never forgetting how the Savior saved me from the lower regions that almost permanently claimed me. A famous quote from a mountaineer says it best for me. You cannot stay on the summit forever. You have to come down again. So why bother in the first place? Just this, what is above knows what is below, but what is below does not know what is above. One climbs, one sees, one descends, one no longer sees, but one has seen. There is an art of conducting oneself in the lower regions by the memory of what one saw higher up. When one can no longer see, one can at least still know. I ask anyone that is hearing this talk to please get with me and help me get this message to others that need to hear it. Elder Kevin Pearson of the 70 gave me a special blessing to do just that for the rest of my life. He asked me in that blessing and told me that I was to use the good and the bad the ugly, and the ugly from my story for the greater good. I'll go anywhere, anytime, and speak to anyone that this message might help. And I have the impression that many of you do the same thing, and I'm grateful for that. This is the van I drive around, this last little video clip. I don't get paid anything for it. The other side academy is a nonprofit organization anyway. It's free for anyone that wants to save their life from chronic bad behavior. I simply have taken my fearless moral inventory and put it out there for all to see. Like I said, I'm not afraid anymore. I'm no longer ashamed. Mary, will you come up here and play video number three? Thank you. 
In closing, I'd like to share with you something that a close brother shared with me. His name is Nathan Savage, and he's been a big support to me in my recovery. It's hard to take 20 words, put them together, and have them be more powerful than these. If you're watching on Zoom, please write these down. If you're here, I've made copies for you, and come up and get a copy. Put these words on your wall. Next will you say our prayers. And I promise you, it will fill you with hope when you need the strength. Here are the 20 words. If you saw the size of the blessing coming, you would understand the magnitude of the battle you're fighting. This is what recovery brings. If we ask for the gift of the redeeming power of Jesus Christ to make us whole, this gift will lift us all to new summits. I bear solemn testimony of the knowledge of this gift, even the redeeming power of Jesus Christ, to overcome any challenge. And I do this by the sure knowledge and the power and name of he who saves us all, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, James. Um, we'll invite uh, Brother Brown to come forward to give some uh, final remarks. And after his remarks, we will sing our closing hymn.
uh, hymn number 113, Our Savior's Love. We'll just sing one verse, after which our closing prayer will be offered by Sister Scholl. And then just as a reminder, we will have uh, the Q&A right after the closing prayer. Brother Brown. Uh, yeah, um, good evening, brothers and sisters. It's been wonderful to be with you and to hear this inspiring story of faith and recovery. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of things with you. Um, one, I'll give a commercial plug to the Other Side Academy Movers. They moved my household two years ago and it was fabulous and best money I've ever spent. Um, second, just in terms of uh, we're, we're part of the addiction recovery program here run by the church. We have two meetings going on tonight. One is a, uh, a, a meeting for those who are affected by addiction that will be right out here at 7.30 p.m. The other is a family support meeting. Uh, the <clears throat> meeting for those affected by addictions on the right side of the hallway, those uh, suffering or uh, those who are family members on the left side of the hallway. So we invite you to attend those. We also run a number of other meetings, and uh, that's those are on a uh, pink sheet that we have that's on the bulletin board out there if you're interested in that. Uh, finally, just wanted to share a brief testimony of the Savior, Jesus Christ, and his power to redeem and restore and to, uh, to bring back to our lives those things that we have lost, as we've heard Brother Moyle testify of, and I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we could be here tonight. We're grateful for the Union Fort Stake, um, for providing the building that we get to meet in. And we're very grateful for the Dixons and the Charettes for all of the extra, pre extra preparations they do to make sure that these fire sites happen. And tonight we're really grateful for Brother Moyle and for his honesty and ask thee to bless each one of us with the things that we struggle with, that we can be honest with ourselves and move forward so that we can be able to have thy spirit and power with us to testify of the Savior and of the, his redeeming grace and have the strength to help others. We're grateful for the message that he gave. We're grateful for his family and for his daughter and for their ability to forgive and ask thee to help us also to learn from that. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Sister Scholl. Um, 
What a powerful, powerful, vulnerable story. Um, at this time, we want to do question and answers. Uh, James, would you come up here with me? Um, those of you who are online again, uh, if you haven't already, text up questions, and um, we'll uh, do our best to go through until about 23 or 24 after, and then we'll have to shut it down and go to the meetings, okay? If you can, if there's questions here, um, repeat it because okay. online won't be able to, to hear it. So, questions. Okay, so the question is, um, those that go in and repent and go through the repentance process and confess to their bishop, but don't go through the process of getting a sponsor and doing a fearless moral inventory, what's the difference? The difference is that you have to do both. If you're only doing one of those, that's only doing half the work. The other half of the work is to be with your peers, like the people that are here today. I'm guessing they all are interconnecting with each other. And so that, that's absolutely vital. Good question. Next question. So the, the, so the question is, how do, how do you deal with life's pressure cooker with those things that would normally make you want to go use? Okay. Um, so the, the greatest part of the recovery process is having people that you can instantly bounce things off of. It's crucial. So that's why we got to be careful with the anonymity thing. We've got to be able to speak to some people. We have to be able to do that. And yeah, you can not use your last name, but eventually people are going to learn who you are. You're, you're texting them back and forth. You're communicating with them. So you have to have relationships with people. You can, if you get tipped about something, something happens on the street in traffic or whatever, and it's triggering you, you've got to do something about it immediately. Call somebody. Reach out to somebody. It doesn't always have to be your sponsor. It could just be one of your peers. Good question. Next question. I got one here as you're thinking about it, okay? Um, James, you, you talked a lot about step four. I have been in many step fours, step four meetings, or, or 12 step meetings where people have said, until I did a fearless step four, I could not maintain a long-term sobriety. That's your story. You said that basically. Um, maybe put some meat on that bones. What was it about step four? Because perhaps there's those of us in the audience saying, you know what, I, I said I'm going to stop and I can't stop. Why is this happening to me? What do I have to do? Well, here's a story in you that step four was a real key. Maybe you can shed some color on that. That's, that's a great, a great uh, question, Rick, because uh, I, I, had, I had help to do that. I had 150 people that I lived with for two and a half years that immediately held me accountable for not doing it. And, and they would bring me a behavior, something that I knew I needed to work on, and it became my job to take something to my pillow every night and do something about it, wake up the next morning and make a change. And I had to have help with that. You know, um Hindsight's 2020. I'm sure it wasn't the funnest thing in the world to go two and a half, take two and a half years out of your life, put it on hold, and to go through that process. Hindsight's 2020. What could you have done differently now that you know what you know to have avoided that two and a half year stint? Yeah, that's a good question too. I've, I've thought about that a lot. Um, 
especially when I'm asked to reach out to people that have op they, 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 they haven't really taken an option yet to do something about the recovery and their families really don't know what to do. And so just literally getting that pamphlet and then the workbook, the 12 steps of the addiction recovery process for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, just going through, starting at page one and reading it, taking notes, praying about it, asking a lot of questions, going to meetings and asking for help. I didn't have the courage to do that on my own. Boy, that I, I hate to admit that. It doesn't taste very good coming out of my mouth, but it's the truth. You know, I had to have help with it, but, uh, it, but are, it's because I let the behaviors you, go on for so long. Are you saying that, I mean, when you said that, it, by small things, great things come to pass, the Lord says. Are you saying that, you know what, it, it, before I went to Tulsa, I, I was not wanting to ask for help. I didn't do the sponsor thing. I didn't do the fearless fourth interview. Uh, that, that, that is what, what hurt me. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I am, and, and my two biggest weaknesses were entitlement and inhumility. And so it, it held me back. It was like walking around carrying two 45-pound dumbbells and thinking that I could walk through life, life normally. And all I had to do was let those go, let the inhumility go, let the entitlement go, because I wasn't anybody. I became a homeless street urchin. You know, why did I still have entitlement and inhumility? That's just crazy. But being able to do the simple steps and open my mouth and be honest, that's what I have to do today. So I'm actually still working the steps. I mean, all of us that are in recovery keep going around and around with the 12 steps, you know, and you just get a little bit stronger every round. Okay. Next question. And okay. That's a good question, too. So the question was, did I resent the people that I went through treatment with? You, you're darn right I did. You know, we did not get along, and it was not pretty. Because I came in as a fighter, you know, and I fought everything. But there's never been an act of violence at the other side of the academy. Now, I've been through, I lost track of how many treatment centers I went through, you know, through the years. Probably spent $100,000 on treatment centers. But it was not until I was in a group of people just like what I had become that held me accountable, and boy, I hated it. Those, those we call them breakthrough groups twice a week where they bring you a behavior, and they do not, you get, there's 25 people in the room, and you don't fool one of them, not for a second. They, they see you coming before you even get there, you know? <laughs> and so it's that accountability and being held to it, you know, is what helps me the most. Uh, two questions in reference to shame. Um, we know that core center of addiction is shame. Different than guilt. Guilt, I did something wrong, I can repent. Shame, I am wrong. I'm worthless. So, you mentioned and you talked about shame. Two questions. How did you work through the shame that you were numbing out? How did you do that? And Maybe talk about how a person can relieve the shame that is gripping them right now. I was talking about that last night with my cute friend Jenny on the back row there. And the, the answer is that I, the, the hardest thing for me was shame. And shame is what put a needle and kept a needle in my arm. There's no question about that. And shame... I thought, you know, my parents used to say shame on you. I thought shame was really acceptable in a way. I just had to deal with it and work through it. Well, shame is not acceptable. Shame is a tool of the adversary, period. It is not in the Lord's tool belt. Guilt, on the other hand, that's okay not to wallow in it, but to say, hey, I never want to do that to my family again, you know. So the process for me has been separating guilt from shame. So... Um, this, this idea of shame, um, 
people want, you know, we, we just want to not open up. We want to hide the secrets and, and we want to numb out and then it makes it worse and it makes it worse. Um, maybe what, what was in the core, middle of the core of shame for you? What was it that was so gripping and kept you in, a, in addiction so long in jail 10, 15 times that, that you finally were able to release, f figure out what that was and then release it? Oh, wow. Yeah, this is, this is easy for me to talk about, but it's, it's, again, very distasteful for me to talk about. And that is because I became a complete coward. And everybody in my family was strong. And I didn't resent them for it. I loved them for it. But I was a coward. I couldn't wait, no matter what I was doing, to numb that shame so I didn't have to feel it. And it was my cowardice that kept me in that vicious circle. And, and, and Sister Dixon said, how did you break through it? How did you break through that? So the, 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 the greatest thing that happened for me was about three years ago. I had been sober for about six months. It was almost four years ago. I was sober about six months. And I was finally able to start to stop shaming myself to the point where I could get down on my knees and start to pray again. Total game changer for me. Consistent daily prayer, consistent daily scripture study, consistent, you know, looking in the mirror and saying, hey, that's, that was a pretty crappy behavior, James. Why did you do that? You know, and not shaming myself, just doing something about it, talking to somebody about it, or getting my knees and ask for, asking for help. That was the game changer for me. So, so what's the difference between shaming and holding someone accountable? We shouldn't ever try to shame anybody. That's just, a, like I was saying, that's just a tool of the adversary. We shouldn't even be talking about that. Um, holding them accountable is saying, hey, brother, I love you, man. This is the behavior that I see. I am you, and you are me. And sometimes with some of the people, you know, we get pretty colorful in how we say that. It's extremely direct and in your face. But there's a way to do it with love. I mean, there's been several times where I thought this guy was going to come out of his chair and pound me, you know. And, okay, you got to learn how to take a punch, right? You know, sometimes I'm not talking really literally, you know. But if someone has a behavior to bring me today, I'm grateful for them. I'm not angry at them anymore. I, I, I see it coming from a place of love. They're making the effort to bring me behavior, and I, I'm grateful. Uh, online question. I love your story, James. What advice would you give parents with adult children in addiction? By far, the biggest thing is to not enable. That's so, there is so, the hardest form of love to administer is tough love. It wasn't until my family loved me enough to completely cut me off that I finally, and I went through a pretty rough process and was lucky to live through it, but I had, but I had to have them cut me off and say, we love you too much to enable you anymore. You know, that, that, that reminds me, we were taught when we were going through this in our family that um, there's two things that make addiction worse. One is using, and number two is enabling by a family member. So what exactly is that? Enabling versus helping. Here, let me, I got, I got Maybe you can address that. Let me, let, let me address that in a story, and I'll be quick. So I had a fraternity brother that called me about a year ago and said, I'm coming into town, and somebody sent me your story, and God, it's nice to reconnect with you. You're lucky to be alive. Um, do you have enough sobriety now to, to help rescue others? I said, absolutely. You know, I'm th about three and a half years now sober. And he said, well, this is kind of a tall order, but I've got a, a, a younger brother in, homeless in a homeless camp. It's a pretty scary homeless camp. And it's a series of homeless camps. And, and I knew where it was, and I, I knew about it. And he flew into town, and I said, let's go find him. 
And so we went and found him. And we got to a certain place in these homeless camps with the drug dealers and pit bulls and how it works. I had to tell my friends, you can't go with me in here. And they said, oh, no, we're going with you. We got your back. And I knew that they wouldn't be able to have my back, that I would be lucky to protect myself. And so I had to have them wait. And I went, and I came out with a big scratch on my face. And, but I had found this guy, and I was able to sneak a, a homing device in his, um, in his backpack. And uh, then, then I came back out, and I said, OK, well, we know where he is now. Now now's the hard part. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, we need to get your siblings together, because his parents had passed away. We need to get your siblings together and do an intervention. They're like, oh, don't you want to do the intervention with him? I said, no, I'm going to do it with you. And so I sat down with all the siblings, and they were paying his phone bill and letting him come over and shower and taking him down to charge his food card. And you think, oh, you know, those are pretty basic needs. You're going to help your family member with that. And I said, nope, you're killing him. Because if he goes out and uses an ODs, it's not because you didn't pay for his food, you know, pay for his cell phone bill or give him a blanket. He's using your resources. He's using what resource he has left to go out and get loaded. And so as soon as they understood this concept, and I said, if you're willing to do that intervention with you, first of all, you've got to convince me that you're going to do it and you're not going to enable anymore. I'm not going to waste my time. And then you've got to convince him, and he's going to be the hard one to convince because he knows how to push all of your buttons. And they're like, well, how do, how, how do you even know how to find him? And this was the sisters talking. And I said, well, I, I know exactly where he is. And so he went and did that intervention, and I didn't say a word, not until the end. I shared my story at the end after this man was in tears knowing that his family had just completely cut him off and they were doing it out of love and he believed it. He's been at the Other Side Academy about eight months now. So enabling is doing something for someone that they can and should do on their own. Exactly. And for them. Okay. One more question. And um, James, I want you to get into your heart. And I want you to talk about her, about your family, your kids, and what it was like before when you had no contact, you had no relationship. How are you feeling? Did you think, I'll never have a relationship with them again? That hopelessness. I want you to go there for a second because we have, I feel it, we have some here that are listening that are feeling that same way and they're thinking, I will never be able to have that relationship again. Develop that thought a little bit and then what your relationship is now. Actually, I'll have Barry come up and talk too, but I won't. She's done presentations with me and and gotten up in the Q&A and answered very articulately what that process was like. But what happened was um, when they could find me um, and my kids would find out about it, they would, they would find me. And I would be in this total embarrassing state. You know, and they had to see me like that. And I didn't want them to see me like that. And of course, the shame was horrible. And, but... I never once felt judged by any of them. Dad, we love you. We, we know the kind of warrior you once were, and we, we, we see your potential, but we know that you don't. And they begged me to go back to the other side academy when I left the first time and said, that's absolutely what you need. And <clears throat> the, se the second I was ever sober, jail was so painful for me because I would sober up when I was in there. And all I would think about is them and my stewardship and how I was not honoring my stewardship and it just ripped my heart out. And so when they got with me the last time when I was in that physical rehabilitation center learning how to walk again, Bishop Meacham got them up there and, and they came in together collectively and said, we really want you to do this. Please do it. And 
I had such a lack of confidence for a guy that was incredibly confident his whole life. I, I, I had lost my confidence. But it was picturing them in my mind that is, is what really got me help. There, there's no question about that. James, thank you for being so vulnerable. And thank you for coming up as a daughter. And it was neat to see you guys together. And I felt it. I didn't just see it. So thank you. Um, next uh, month, we've got a great fireside, the es 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 Espens. They are incredible. They're going to share a story of uh, addiction that they went through as a couple. And then um, the, uh, the great hope and the great uh, success that they've had. You, you won't want to miss it. It's an incredible story. Now, um, can I just close by saying this? As I look at James, when he was out uh, on the outs and he was uh, five years on the streets, uh, you know, doing drugs, alcohol, um, disobedient to the commandments, doing everything opposite of perhaps what a person who's trying to live right would be doing. And yet, in the depths of that, in his deepest pit, he prayed. And that's when a miracle after miracle started happening that changed everything. If any of us feel, well, uh, I'm beyond help or hope. I don't know if there's a God that could love me or help me or even know who I am. I testify that our Heavenly Father knows you. He knows every hair on your head. He knows your name. He knows how you feel. And he's asking us just to reach out. Just reach out, because he's got miracles for each of us. I testify that God lives, that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. we got two meetings starting in two minutes right out the hall. Thank you, everybody. Hey, you bet, of course, thank you.
see 